I'm going to talk about taking leaps of faith today. When's really the right time to change my career, start my company? I've been through all of these things. I'm putting myself in your shoes today. And I know that we're in quite the crazy world. And I'm an open book. So even if after this, you don't feel comfortable asking your question, I'll give you my contact information. I feel like uh, juniors and seniors in college hold a very special place in my heart. Um, I was there a long time ago, but I still feel like I know what it feels like to be where you guys are. And so I just, I want you guys to know that. Um, just some background on who I am. So my husband and I are both SDSU alum and we met at college and worked at the same startup back in the early 2000s. We've been together for a little over 20 years, which sounds absolutely insane to say out loud. We've been married, happily married for 14, and business partners in three different businesses. So I moved to San Diego in 99 uh, from the Reno Tahoe area and just was trying to figure out what I was going to do. Um, after a few really bad, serious um, accidents snowboarding in Tahoe, I realized I wasn't gonna get paid to snowboard for the rest of my life. So I found my way to San Diego and got accepted to SDSU um, and still didn't feel like I belonged. Uh, I was, you know, had an interesting upbringing from a young age where I was taught I could do anything regardless of social status, started racing motorcycles when I was seven years old and snowboarding became my life. And so I just was going, what am I going to do? You know, I should, I should probably go to college. So I wasn't actually the first generation in my family to graduate from college. And so that was an interesting enough experience for me in of itself. Um, and while I was at SDSU, I was working for one of San Diego's fastest growing tech startups at the time. They're still around today, but a much different company today called Z57, which really helped pave the way for a lot of my success in my career. Um, and between 2000 and 2006, I was in sales and marketing and a lot of different leadership roles um, after I had graduated SDSU. And was a marketing director. And in 2006, when I was 28 years old, I actually started my first company. Um, and I hit a plateau, you know, doing that and just felt stuck. And um, so out of, you know, lots of different experiences working for companies in San Diego, just felt like I wanted to start my own company and started G-Wave Consulting, which was a marketing agency. And out of that was born Tap Hunter. We recently rebranded to Evergreen. And so Tap Hunter, it was initially a consumer facing app that would help people find where all their favorite beers and whiskeys and wines were. Uh, so in 2012, my husband, um, otherwise known as Flash Gordon, his real name's Jeff, and I founded Tap Hunter. And I'll share a little bit of, of that journey with you guys. It has been a long, crazy, windy road, and I'm actually, you know, doing things today I never thought I would even be doing either. Um, I mentor for several accelerators. I'm a, a mentor at Techstars. If you're not familiar with what Techstars is, let me know, hit me up. Um, and we recently reorged our company after seven years and went completely remote. This was all before COVID. Um, and have recently taken a step back from the company and promoted a director of operations to run the day to day. So I've actually haven't been running the day to day of my company for probably the last year or so. Um, so it's been a very crazy journey. And I haven't, you know, a lot of people don't know that, um, that I'm not running the day to day. And so I'm finding myself yet again, uh, reinventing myself at age 42. <laughs> so um, I'm really excited to jump into more of the details of how we started the company, but mostly this is for you guys. I want to answer your questions. I've done several talks at San Diego Startup Week called The Shit That Startup Founders Don't Talk About. 
Um, and I'm also one of the founders of San Diego Startup Week. And October is actually San Diego Startup Month. <laughs> they're doing a month long virtual version of it. So if you guys aren't aware of that yet, get connected, get plugged in to uh, San Diego Startup Month in October. Melanie, and we're, yes. we're actually sponsors. Yes. And um, we'll be sharing the benefits with the Zip Launchpad as well as um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem at SDSU. I just That's excellent. Yet, but we are sponsors. <laughs> yes, I love it. I'm so glad to hear that. San Diego is doing amazing things to support the entrepreneur community. So um, it just makes me really excited to even be here talking to you guys. All right, so, and again, there's my contact information. Um, I'm starting a business coaching business. I have some other app startup things we're working on in the background. My husband and I are working on starting our um, third company. And um, if you want to hit me up at my email, I've scheduled lots of little one-on-one -on -one, um, side Zooms in the past month or so with, with handfuls of, of SDSU students. Um, I have a little bit of time on my hands right now to, to give back where I can until I get busy again, but I'm here for you guys. So Tap Hunter, as, as it started out, originally was a consumer facing uh, B2C app. And we evolved pretty quickly um, into a B2B software as a service platform. So today, we provide software to bars and restaurants all across the United States to help them market and manage their entire food and beverage program. So uh, Bottlecraft being one of my favorite San Diego venues is one of my favorite customers. And so if you've ever been into a Bottlecraft and seen um, some of their digital signage, we power all of that. And so that is what Tap Hunter does today. We recently rebranded, so I can kind of take you guys through that evolution and, and why that happened. Um, but really there's some key takeaways is finding your sticky product feature. And this ultimately ended up being ours, but only after a very, very long and windy road. <laughs> the first time I showed this slide, um, it was really well received because I realized a lot of founders were not sharing this part of the journey. They were only sharing the hockey stick and up to the right part of their journey. And so this is really what I want to share with you guys today so you can understand what our journey looks like and what a lot of others do. So um, I started the marketing agency in 2006. It was very successful, but that's just not what I wanted to stick with. Um, we worked for a SaaS based company and I saw the power of that business model very quickly. And so I knew that I always wanted to get back to that. Tap Hunter was probably one of six different things that we had built out of that agency. So don't undervalue the um, notion of consulting or freelancing on the side until you figure out and iterate on what it is that you truly want to go after. And then it was towards the end of 2011, um, we started making some strides in generating revenue, but this revenue was coming from beer events, advertising on our website, um, and also Groupon and Living Social were having their heyday during this time. And so we were trying to figure out ways to monetize our consumers. And so we had a great run. We private labeled a Groupon platform and monetized our consumer base, but it ultimately wasn't something that was gonna be sustainable. So we were constantly searching for new business models, including launching a career, um, an industry career board. And we started selling Stone Brewing Company um, job postings on our industry board. We tried everything. And it wasn't until the beginning of 2012 that we got accepted into Evo Nexus. We were one of nine of the first tech companies to go through that program in downtown San Diego. And that's when things completely changed for us. 
we were surrounded by great mentorship and we're continuing to be pushed to, to test different business models. And what we ultimately learned was that it was the bars and restaurants who were struggling most, not the consumers. And we realized that unless we were gonna get, you know, five, 10, 15, 20 million app downloads, it was gonna be really hard to build a sustainable business. So as hard as it was, we pivoted. And we pivoted very quickly uh, to selling our tools and services to bars and restaurants in San Diego. And so that's where I like to say, um, you can kind of see the, the second orange line there of a real business is born is when we really started to feel uh, that traction and not just feel it, but understand key metrics that were repeatable that we could consistently produce month over month. So the year of 2012 was me walking around downtown San Diego with an iPad and a PowerPoint selling bars our service um, that would help them tweet and post automatically about all the new beverages that they had before the product was actually built. So as fast as I could pitch it and sell it, and I was collecting cash, checks, and credit card, and I would bring it back to Evo Nexus and say, hey, business partner, uh, who is my husband, uh, we need to build this because this is what they want. And so he would stay up all night um, building that feature so that I could go back out and keep collecting credit cards from bars in San Diego. So I sold probably the first 150 to 200 paying customers um, that we had. And now today we've helped over 5,000 bars and restaurants, obviously with a pretty big team. I share all this because you gotta be scrappy in the early days. And one of the biggest misconceptions that I have found along the way with early stage founders is that you need to have someone on your team who is not afraid to get out and pound pavement or pound the phones. And I mean, cold calling. I spoke to a SDSU founder last week and he is not afraid to pound the phones. He had his script, we rehearsed it together. Um, and so this can be scary for people, but one person on your founding team has to be able to do this. I just happen to love sales, <laughs> not everybody does. So just know that that is a part that could not be overlooked. During that summer, we made some big decisions and we were capturing some really great traction. And that means that bars and restaurants would sign up for a monthly subscription and we could continue to grow at X amount month over month for six or 12 months in a row while still showing that these customers would retain and not churn out. And those are ultimately the metrics or uh, KPIs or key performance indicators that we, we had three of them. And we just kept surpassing our goals every month. And that's when we really had to make a decision if we were gonna raise money or not. And we ultimately chose to raise money, that we had a really great machine <laughs> that if you put X amount of dollars in, you can get X amount of dollars out. And so we went on to raise um, over $1.2 million for our company. So the third orange uh, mark here is my first paycheck. <laughs> and this is a big part that a lot of founders don't talk about. And so money is the conversation of money is very difficult for people and you're not alone if you're wondering you know how do people make this work um and it's difficult and i will be the first to say that so you know we started the agency and the agency through customer work funded tap hunter and 2012 our company was funded by customer revenue and so we didn't really start, you know, going out and raising serious money until, you know, 2013 and, and the like. And so um, knowing and understanding and being prepared um, for that, right? Do you have enough, uh, what I like to call the personal burn spreadsheet? You guys might hear 
people say what's your burn and you know for your company and your burn spreadsheet and your financials but you really have to understand what your uh, personal burn is and how how much longevity you have to be able to last to to get your company off the ground is really really important oops there we go aside from the business for me personally and my philosophy is flash and eyes philosophy was team and culture is everything regardless of what we built that was our initial philosophy we didn't care what product or what company we built we knew that you spend the majority of your life at work around people <laughs> that we really wanted to about val you know value and appreciate and help them along on their career path because we were afforded the same opportunity and so for the last you know eight-ish years with tap hunter since 2012 that has been our number one almost even before customers i've had nasty customers that i wasn't afraid to fire because they actually yelled at one of my customer service reps and so we led with culture where i know a lot of companies will lead with product and what industry they're going after and look we weren't going to save the world you know helping people find beer <laughs> initially it was let's hire a great team and everything else will fall in line and it certainly did for us so i can talk all day about culture how to hire how to fire company values all that kind of stuff but i like to share what really our core philosophy was in building tap hunter so i want to step through some really really key takeaways for you guys in taking that leap of faith regardless of wherever you're at on your journey right now and really challenge you to kind of dig in and think through some of these things and this is what's really helped me along my journey and then i can kind of share with you know how we even ended up where we are today so number one is making sure it's really what you want you know i remember going to college because they said you should go to college so i did <laughs> it was hard for me i had a very uh tough college experience but i'm very grateful that i had a professor that took me under his wing and allowed me to work on some of his mba projects around internet strategy and marketing and when i was at sdsu the Lavin Center and Zip Launch didn't exist yet. And so I really encourage you guys to take advantage of those programs because even if you're not sure what you wanna do or be when you grow up, it's gonna be those programs that give you a safe place to experiment and to fail and to get the mentorship that I wish I would have had. It was almost you know 2012, which was years after I graduated where, where I got that. Um, don't be afraid to, to take um, that corporate job and learn the ins and outs of business while still having your business idea and side hustle on the side. Don't underestimate um, getting that experience, right? I ended up and started climbing the corporate ladder and I realized it wasn't for me. And I got very frustrated um, and was unhappy. And so there's, you know, those those forks in the road that you have to take but it's invaluable experience um, i really learned that i just love business and creating products but mostly developing people um, but it took all of those other experiences to realize that and going through and working for lots of other companies to realize what it was that i really wanted so don't be afraid if you haven't figured it out yet um, and make sure it's really what you know what you want even if your idea or your company that you're working on today is you know you're wavering and what its mission is or what the purpose is um, don't be afraid to slow down and, and change your ideas and pivot to kind of industries and markets and things um, that matter for you so number two is understanding your your own motivations um, you know i really wanted to be in control of my own financial destiny so that entrepreneurship was 
for me was a huge part of, of that freedom. Um, and, you know, freelancing and consulting on the side um, is such an admirable way to get started. I think lots of people get confused and lost in the minutia of, oh, you have an idea, you build a product, you raise money and you get going. And that's not the only path, right? Lots of people don't talk about the paths of how they actually fund their companies self-funded through friends and family, through customer revenue. Um, I'm a salesperson. You can have a great idea, but if you're not generating revenue off your idea, it's gonna be very difficult for you to raise money anyway, especially in today's market. Um, number three is building a support network, which I know through Zip and Lab and Center um, is a big one, but this I cannot stress enough. Um, you need a trustworthy tribe that can support you through the highs and lows. I still have on speed dial probably five people that when I want to pop a bottle of champagne and celebrate, I call them. Or when I've hit a low and I need to scream it out or cry it out, um, there's another entrepreneur like-minded person that's willing there to, you know, is there listening to me. Listening, not trying to fix this was this becomes really i think gets overlooked because the entrepreneur journey can be very lonely especially if there's friends and family around you who are looking at you sideways because they're just going wait you want to do what with what <laughs> you're you're leaving your corporate job to do what um so this i cannot stress that enough the importance of that and seeking mentorship and surrounding yourself with with others the biggest thing we got out of even nexus was being in a 20,000 square foot space with nine other founders um, and their co-founders, you know, sleeping under our desks at night and going, 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 and knowing that we weren't alone and we weren't crazy. <laughs> Number four is taking calculated risks. So you don't need to jump into the deep end first and find yourself <laughs> drowning. Um, and you want to set checkpoints and goals along the way. So when we went into Evo Nexus, we were out of college. We still had the agency running, but didn't want to fully walk away from our contracts there until we knew we had some good traction. And we set very specific goals for ourselves in 2012. Um, you know, we were living on ramen that year, X amount of years out of college. We sold our car and became a one car family again. And we pushed all our chips in the middle of the table. And we said, we're gonna give ourselves 12 months to make this work. And if we don't hit these goals by the end of 2012, then we're gonna both go back to either, you know, running the agency, freelancing on the side or get jobs. And so that was, this, that was a very, very big sacrifice that we made. Um, So, oops, where you are at right now, so my, you know, my parents taught me that there's no free lunches and I got where I am today, not based on, you know, what we had or didn't have as a family. I, I got here by working hard and persevering. So I want you guys to kind of think right where you are, where you're sitting to think to yourself and write down where you want to be one year from now. Um, I think it's super important to get intentional about um, what it is that you're working on. Is it really what you want to be working on? Understanding your own motivations. Do you have the right support network around you? Are you taking enough risk, not enough risk, and really getting um, intentional with where you want to be one year from now? I know this is a crazy world, but <laughs> I feel there's no better time than now to be starting a company. Um, I know Jenny asked me to talk a little bit about, you know, why we started what we did. And I said the people and ultimately on our tap hunter journey, we ended up rebranding to evergreen so that we could expand into new markets and not just be specific to one industry. And I'm so glad that we did that pre COVID or else we might, you know, we're selling software to bars and restaurants in the middle of COVID. Um, there couldn't be a more <laughs> uh, 
crazy time for that. And so we're navigating our company through very, very interesting times. Um, ultimately, everyone on our team truly values and believes that small businesses are the economic backbone of America. And while it may not feel like that today, we still truly feel like that every day when our um, team who is operating on the front lines and keeping the company going. And so um, it is a very interesting time to be running a company right now, but I couldn't be more proud about the team that we built um, and in the excitement that they have to continue helping, you know, our customers. We do have other customers beyond bars and restaurants. Um, I'm happy to answer questions and talk about that evolution and the product and all that good stuff. But um, again, I wanted to give, just kind of going back through some of these slides, a little bit about me and my background and our journey, um, our sticky product today that continues to keep our customers with us. We're ingrained in their operations and helping them to you know, operate more efficiently and sell more. Ultimately, booze, that's where the profits are in restaurants. So if we can help restaurants be more profitable today and God knows they need it, um, the profits is in the booze. A little bit of our, our journey <laughs> with Tap Hunter, it wasn't a very, you know, up into the right hockey stick over a year. This was multiple years in the making. Um, culture and people is still everything to me today. Don't get me wrong, I love our customers, but um, our team is, is the most important thing. Um, and then really kind of four things that have guided me along the way. So in terms of making sure what it's really what I wanted, what I learned a year ago is that I wasn't living my values. And I was burnt out and tired and lived and worked downtown and the concrete jungle and went into the office and was working, you know, 70, 80 hour weeks. Um, and ultimately we decided to take our company remote and give people chance to work from wherever they want in the world. Kind of ironic looking where the world is today. It doesn't seem so unique anymore, but I'm excited that we were prepared that our rebrand of our company allowed us to be prepared for all the changes that are going on in the world today. Um, so yeah, we, um, I no longer actually reside in San Diego anymore. <laughs> if we were ultimately going to live the van life for the next two to three years and travel around and still run our company. Um, but COVID has kind of pushed us off that course, but, um, uh, my husband and I just got back from hiking half of the John Muir trail. So, um, we, have started to figure out how to reintegrate and align our values back into our life while still running our company. And we're still figuring it out um, all these years later and three companies later. And um, he and I are brainstorming our next ideas for a mobile app. We really miss that startup stage and working together. So after running a successful company, we're very profitable. Um, we're paying profit dividends back to investors we're ready to do something else. And so we've started to hand over the reins to um, our existing leadership team. And hopefully in the not too distant future, we'll be uh, starting another product and mobile based type company and um, go through this cycle all again. So in some ways I'm kind of right back where a lot of you guys might be in your ideation and prototype stage, which is pretty exciting. So um, I'll kind of stop and pause there. I would love to uh, answer any questions that you guys might have for me. So I've got a question for you, Melanie. Um, mm -hmm. Just curious, can you tell us what's one of the best decisions you've made as a CEO of Evergreen and Tap Hunter, and what is one of the toughest decisions you've had to make? Mm. Best and toughest. So I would say. So toughest decisions for me always and still is to this day um, is letting people go. It, it is, <laughs> it never gets any easier. You just get more skilled at the process. And if you're an emotional person like me and you take that as you're the one that failed, it can be very difficult. So that's still one of the toughest things for me today. 
Um, one of the best decisions I made. <laughs> so I actually learned this leadership style um, by retrofitting what some of other leaders I saw the way that they were managing their company. So I'll, I'll, I'll kind of give you an example. Um, there's two leaders that I had valued and I seen their leadership style as butts and seats managers, what I like to call butts and seats. Um, I know that world's fast changing, but it could go back, you know, people going back into offices. And so what I mean by butts and seats was every single person in the company had to be in at seven o'clock lunch was this, if you weren't in your seat, you weren't producing. Um, and I'm a very type A competitive type person, hence my background, if, if that doesn't come across. Um, I lead very differently today. And so I just borrowed that as like, oh, that's how successful people do this because he's been really successful. If I just copy or emulate that, um, that's going to work for me too. And it didn't. It didn't work for me. <laughs> that wasn't my natural leadership style. Um, and so one of the best decisions I made was learning how to let go of being kind of a micromanager, a micromanager that I always, you know, just never wanted to be. Um, and so I was, I was able to slowly and with a business coach, able to let go of that and allow my team to lead and get out of the way. Um, and I wish I would have done it sooner. And so yeah you okay. live and learn <laughs> so true thanks for sharing so yeah. i'm getting a number of questions okay privately messaged to me right uh, so i'll go through those and then while we're going through those feel free to drop them in the group chat yeah um, okay so first question is from mckenna um she's asking how do you know when and why to sell your company mm. That's a great question. So there's two ways to answer this. If you have investors or if you don't have investors, when and how, you know, when and why to sell your company when you have investors is highly dictated by your investors. Anyone, an angel or a VC who's investing, they're, they want a seven to 10 year exit which is typically a sell or acquisition. So that's highly dictated by your investors. A lot of times they'll be heavy handed in that process in the how and the why. If you own the company and you don't have a lot of investors, maybe you have one, the how and the why is very personal. It becomes very personal. Um, we worked through that process with an investment banker who set up a very intentional how and why and what would you sell for. Um, and so it just depends, right? If you have investors or not, I think is probably a really big part of the answer to that question. Also, if you reverse engineer, the question is, how do you know if you want to take money from investors or not? <laughs> There you go. Another way to look at it. Yeah. They're your boss. Your yeah. investors are your boss. Yeah. Good question. Okay. So the next question is from Myra. She's asking, uh, well, first off, she says, I think it's really inspirational that you are a first generation student, work so hard to create a company. I myself am first generation and hope to do the same in the future. Her question is, how has your company shifted during the early stages of the pandemic? A lot. So the bills and the COVID Care Act were changing so quickly and we were losing so many restaurant customers. It was scary. And, you know, I've led through uncertain times and of the best times, but this was something else. It was a double whammy. We're in one of the most hard hit industries is hospitality and bars and restaurants. So we jumped in, we had support with HR to figure out what the paycheck protection program would be. 
how would we could continue to keep our team together and brainstorming ways to continue to work to generate revenue outside of the industry which we would had already been doing so i had friends that were working for 500 person companies that hadn't heard from their ceo or anyone on their leadership team about what to do how to act were they people being furloughed um my husband and i were so transparent through the process that we were doing because remember we were remote to begin with so we were doing every other day zoom calls and talking through the information as fast as we were receiving it and bringing them along the process with us because no one has been through this and the only way we could keep us together as stress-free as possible if that was even possible was to say guys this is crazy and we're gonna our our promise to you is to bring you along on the journey and that's absolutely what we have done um we were lucky to have um gotten the paycheck protection program which has saved our company it absolutely has saved our company so we we were very vigilant on staying on top of all of this and our culture hasn't i can't remember a time in our company history where our culture has been better like we've as much as it's tough in the past to say oh you shouldn't say you're a family we live in different times now and our our team truly does consider each other family now um which i was afraid of before and now i'm changing again as a leader um you know, our, our employees are, you got to take care of your people right now because these are crazy times. So that's a really good question. I'll stop there. Well, and that transitions nicely to Jessica's question, which is how did you go about maintaining slash cultivating a company culture while moving to the remote setting? Yeah. So people were surprised, but not surprised you know we started with um being very open and honest about where flash and i were in terms of r running the company we were a little burnout and tired and that we wanted to start to live our values more of adventuring which meant not showing up in an office every day i don't think people might have believed it at first because remember i was the butts and seats leader they're like yeah nice try mel good one is this an April Fool's joke? Um, so they were worried about not having the structure and the office and being in person. Um, it took a few days for them to realize that this was an option. And through painting the picture of what it could mean for each of them individually based on their personalities. So I'll give you an example. One employee has lived in like five or seven different countries. This was going to afford him the ability to move anywhere in the world that he wanted to snowboard. He also is a big snowboarder. And then another few weeks later, he brought back his plan to me, which included him living in Asia for six months and it was approved. <laughs> and then he did that. Uh, very quickly after all of this happened. And so I think it was, okay, they're serious. And it took one of the employees to like dip their toe in the water and say, okay, wow, this is real. Um, and so, you know, the transparency of why the change, making it about each individual person and then leading by example. That's also what I had to learn because I was a, a workaholic. So I had to walk the walk, right? I, I had to show them that I was serious about it. Mm -hmm. Good question. Okay, next up is Jim's question. He asked, did you start your companies with strong ideas or by solving problems? The Tap Hunter idea we built for ourselves. <laughs> nice. We had four other products at the time. We had SEO tracking software, I had a female action sport network. I had all these other things I wanted to do. That was built to scratch our own itch. And then it ultimately was the thing that we got the furthest with. <laughs> yeah. 
And then it's evolved though, because I've seen the problem solving language across Evergreen's website. Mm -hmm. So at what point in that process of working with customers do you decide to solve a particular problem? Yeah, I mean, we really had two options. It was to continue expanding the product in the bar and restaurant industry, or did we think that our current platform was applicable to other small businesses? And so ultimately we chose to rebrand so that we could reach and help more small businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the decision we made. So we have a, you know, combo of um, dispensaries and CrossFit and yoga and um, I'm probably forgetting a few categories, but other sectors that the platform has helped. Okay. Uh, Kathy's question is for a first time entrepreneur, what advice do you have regarding raising money? It is hard to raise, but even more difficult if you don't have a proven track record. It sure is. Raising money. <laughs> Uh, once you start raising your, your, you never stop. So I think that, um, I wouldn't change it for the world. So our agency, we didn't raise money and we were all funded through customer projects and we did custom web design, mobile app development for big, huge companies like biotech and pharma. True religion brand jeans was one of my customers we built amazing things. And then with this company, um, our metrics got to a point where it was, do we want to, you know, have a, have a small sliver of a pie that's not very big or a small sliver of a pie that's much bigger. And so we, we saw that we had some really good uh, traction and, and had a great story and ultimately raised money a hundred percent on that story and on that traction. It's very difficult to raise money if you don't have a proven track record of revenue. So it wasn't easy raising money as a female. <laughs> that environment is changing. Thank God. And um, I was often overlooked, you know, as, oh, great story. And okay, is this your, you know, where's the man in the company? And why isn't your husband here pitching with you? And I could tell you a million war stories. But I went in with the confidence in the slides to say, this is our number of customers. This is the revenue they're giving us. They're, you know, retaining every single month. Um, on the flip side, I would encourage you to really think, do you even need to raise money and what does it mean? And so having investors, um, is it seven to 10 year, if not longer time horizon? They're your boss, you answer to them. So you have to really ask yourself, why are you starting the company, right? To be the next Dropbox or Airbnb and IPO and, or I, uh, I mean, there's Pura Vita and blenders and all this. I, I don't know if they ever thought that they would sell out as big as they did, but they did. Um, or do you want to build a lifestyle company where you have zero investors, but you're still a five to $10 million a year company? Both are great options. Raising money is no joke. Um, it's harder to unwind from investors than it is to get a divorce. And I've had two of my attorneys confirm that for me before I kept saying it. I was like, Dan, is this something I could say? He's like, yeah, because we had 27 investors and two who were awful that just drug me down. And it is harder to unwind from investors than it is to get a divorce. <laughs> so you really have to make sure that A, you're ready B, you have the right investors, because um, it's a long, windy road. Now, I wouldn't change it for the world. Today, we have five investors, because we recently bought out our investors um, about a year ago. So my husband and I have 85% of the company, which is great. It's back in our hands. <laughs> nice. Can you expand a little bit on finding the right investors? Like, What criteria are you paying attention to in that process? You know, I think in terms of learning from my mistakes, I didn't slow down and 
in my coffee meetings or face-to-face -face or Zooms with investors, I needed to almost have a, a post-it note up and saying like, are our values aligned? I got very excited, shiny toy syndrome. Oh my gosh, they might be writing me a check. And I got way out over my skis for any for anyone who wanted to write write me a check. Um, and it, it was a it was a tough lesson. There has to be values aligned. How much are they going to be involved? What are they expecting in return? Um, it's a full time job managing investors when you still have to run your company. So, yeah. Sure. Thanks for sharing. So we got one more follow up question. So one of the challenges that teams in the zip launch pad face is this fear or uncertainty of releasing a product before it is ready or good enough. What advice do you have for them? Mm. The sooner you know if you're working on the right things, the better off you are. There's nothing worse than letting six months go by and realize, oh my gosh. Um, there's no such thing as good enough. We're, st we're still working on our product. <laughs> not, not, nothing's ever good enough. So um, being able to really tap into what it is that you're afraid of, right? Um, what is it that you're not ready for? Is it the product or is there something internally that you're personally not ready for? I think oftentimes entrepreneurs biggest demons are personal, not based about the idea or the product, to be honest. Good advice. Okay. Uh, one more question from Karina. How important is social media to a startup and getting exposure? very important however we have to be careful right now i mean with TikTok in the news and how under fire facebook is right now and being owned by instagram it's very concerning to me um i adopt the philosophy that your email list and customer list couldn't be more important so emails and phone numbers back to grassroots of of you know now you see lots of companies and brands and things with texting and um this is a very uncertain time and i think you have to be very careful to hang your hat on social media exposure right now be, regardless of how the election year ends up the social media platforms are under fire so you have to think about what that means and how to get creative um, through other channels and methods, especially with the movie Social Dilemma that just came out. There's pros and cons to that movie <laughs> for everyone personally, but on the business side of things. That's a great question. Okay, do we have any other questions? I have a quick one. I'm trying to type it, but I can't get in fast enough. No worries. And that we watched that, that um, documentary. I started it, but I didn't finish it. I've been recommending it to everyone in my life, our employees, everyone in my family, my mother and father-in-law who are downstairs right now. It's called The Social Dilemma. It's on Netflix. I was worried to watch it because I'm, you know, a social media uh, addict, shall we call it. And I've been guilty of too much doom scrolling lately. So I used that as a reason to watch it. And it really challenged me um, to think through, to think through a lot of stuff as it relates to my life personally, but also to business and what that means for business in the future and how we get exposure for our companies. It is a really, I think it's a, there's important messages in there, but it's also worrisome. Um, yeah. All right, well, thank you. It looks like that wraps up our questions for you, Melanie. So I just really wanna thank you for taking the time to share your wisdom and advice with us we really appreciate it thank um, you and thank you to everyone who's attended hopefully you have some awesome takeaways from today's 
talk. And uh, just to let everyone else know, we do have our next speaker coming in October 16th. So please, you know, visit our website and check out the upcoming events. We really appreciate it. And Melanie, once again, a big thanks for being here. Absolutely, you guys. Thank you. Keep going. And I'm here for you guys. I can't imagine a more crazy time or crazy world, but I got to tell you, there's never been a better time in the last two decades to launch a company in a more affordable way with the tools that are out there. So if you're thinking like you're second guessing yourself, there literally is no better time than for you to launch your idea or your company than there is today.